Hello, everyone. I'm Abraham Martin. Um, I work for the University of Cambridge, as you may have guessed from the huge logo in the screen. Um, I was thinking about making a little introduction, and I thought mm, everyone knows what the University of Cambridge is, so I think I have little to say about that. And I thought I can show you some pretty pictures so you can invite me where I live and this pretty place and where I work. Um, this nice architecture, these nice rivers where you can punt with uh, your friends uh, during summer, well, the two days of summers we have a year. Uh, <laughs> the classic math bridge, um, and you, as, as you may know, we have a lot of clever people there, um, some Nobel Prizes, um, people that usually walk around the city dressed like this, uh, which are guns. Um, it seems weird, but you, you really see, look at, uh, when you go there, you, you really see these people um, walking around, um, academics. Um, this seems pretty classic, um, pretty old, but we also have pretty nice new buildings, like this one, which is the, um, university, the new university uh, data center, which is uh, one of the top data centers in the UK. Um, it's pretty big, it's green, uh, we have a lot of innovation inside it. Uh, we even have a HPC service, which has, um, in 2003, was the uh, second most green computer in the top 500. Uh, so it's not just classic building and architecture, we also have some cool things. Um, this is the computer lab, um, where I used to work. Uh, I did a, uh, well, I, my relationship with the university started with the computer lab where I was doing my PhD and then I worked there as a postdoc. This building uh, is called William Gates Building because Bill Gates paid uh, for the half of the building. And I work on this building now, which is the university computing service, uh, where we provide IT services for the rest of the, uni of the university. Um, both buildings share a common history. Um, um, and they used to be the mathematical laboratory where this machine, um, brownie, points, if, brownie points, if you know what it is, is the exact computing computer, one of the first computers in the world based on the Bo, uh, von Neumann architecture, uh, was built there. Uh, we still have some pieces uh, in the computer lab as a museum. Uh, but also other things were built there and in the part that I'm working now, which is the university computing service, like Exim, which you probably know about because still 50% of web mails, uh, sorry, mail servers uh, use it. Uh, so we have pretty cool people working there. Uh, I'm not of any of them, but we have some pretty cool people that also work in a lot of open source projects. So what I want to explain to you today is one service that uh, was uh, proposed a lot of years ago, uh, which is the managed web service, and was born to solve a problem. Um, we have a lot of researchers in the university, uh, as you may know, um, and a lot of them usually um, hold a conference, they do research, they want to do some um, simple website with some uh, statistics, to show statistics, show results from the, re the research, or either do questionnaires, et cetera, et cetera. So they end up using their own web servers under the desk. It was a cheap computer. It was running under the, under the desk. It was not maintained, usually, because um, the academics usually use that computer for the conference, and then they left this computer under the desk. The software was not updated, and then we get security problems. We get servers hacked, et cetera, et cetera, you, you know. So the proposal uh, that the, uh, the IT services and the university uh, did for solving that problem was centralizing these web services. Uh, so the solution was to provide a service where you don't have to worry about uh, maintaining the OS or uh, the software. You only have to worry about maintaining the web application. So we maintain the OS. We give basic web hosting capabilities like external services does. Uh, you don't have to worry about backups and you have some dedicated resources to your web app. So that's very, very old. And when I say goal, it's like uh, 15 years ago. Um, I need uh, the first version of the managed web service was using a Solaris 7. 
um, running in a Solaris machine. Um, so you can see that it was using a very old version of Apache, PHP, MySQL, and it was using a true system uh, to maintain the separation between these different web pages. Um, the second version that came uh, uh, sooner than, than, the, than the other one uh, provided a new software, like Solaris 10, Apache 2, more new software, and I started to use Solaris Zones, which Solaris Zones is a, is a kind of a um, virtualization inside a, a Solaris machine. Uh, it's kind of a container. Uh, so we were using containers before it was cool. Um, but it's still pretty old. Um, uh, it, was, it also had like, more enhanced uh, features, like database uh, driven uh, scripts, so you could do scripts based on some information in the database, so it's centralized, it's very to manage, some needs, an NFS server, very classic uh, ZFS uh, file system, so it provides also snapshots, which is good. And the users were able to create vhost, aliases, etc. But the problem was everything is manual. So uh, they had, the users asked to send us an email saying, I want this, and then we make the, ch the changes, we execute the scripts, the scripts uh, make the changes. But everything is manual, so we, we need a lot of human intervention. So when it, uh, when it started to grow, uh, we currently now have more. 200 users and more than 400 websites, it has started to become a little bit difficult to manage because it requires a lot of time. So before we ended up making a new version of the managed web service, another solution was in parallel, which is uh, the Falcon service, which is a uh, plone based. You only get a plone instance. You don't get access to a server or anything. It's just a CMS as a service. And we also have uh, like a 200 uh, websites there. Um, so if you go to any university website, you probably will end up in either a Falcon service or a managed web service service. So for example, the, one of the most visited uh, websites inside this service is the uh, Stephen Hawking's website. Um, so we decided to make from scratch a new service. So restart what we were, have done because you know, we don't have m more Solaris machines. Solaris machines are rooting. They're pretty old. Don't, we don't have a, uh, a, a replacement for that. So, and we also thought, uh, let's do more automation. We can do more automation, so it requires less less time from us. So, um, we decided to go to the classic uh, uh, dedicated VMs, um, but still maintain the uh, same uh, things uh, that was proposed by the previous ones, like no root access for users, and everything is maintained by us. And when I say by us. I mean uh, by Ansible, because we don't touch anything, but uh, we will see that later. And so to end up these emails that comes to our inbox saying, can you please install this package? Can you please install this? Uh, we created a web panel using Django uh, where we delegate some uh, power to the users, so the users can do things without having root access or anything. So architecture is basic, uh, basically a Debian 8 machine. Um, um, we install the basic packages that uh, we have been installing uh, up, up to now, like uh, the Apache, MySQL, PHP, uh, which is the most common feature demand. But we also support other uh, mods uh, Apache available, like Mod Whiskey, if you want to install P uh, Python, uh, or Django, etc. Um, we have also a list of system packages that you can install and that are pre-approved. Uh, so you don't end up with a machine with a lot of packages that you don't need or that are strange to need. Um, and we give them uh, all the power to do authorization to the sites, create the host, apply for domain names, uh, install TLS certificates in the machines, do the backups from them, password resets, power management, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we give them the power to do a lot of things that we were doing before. So they have a panel. Uh, don't blame me for the... Uh, design. Uh, it's an in-house design. If you visit any Cambridge website, you will see that all of them look exactly the same. Um, so it's, a, it's just a panel with some options uh, to manage your, uh, your site. So when you create a site, you get this web panel based on Django. Uh, you have some options to create uh, uh, vhost, uh, um, ask for uh, domain names, etc. 
and you get uh, uh, an extra uh, VM, which is a test server, so you can clone your production server to a test server. You can test things there uh, without having to compromise your production server. So that's good, especially for people that have Drupal uh, installed in the managed web servers. When they update Drupal, really bad things happen. So it's better that you can test it before, and if it goes right, you clone it back uh, to the production server. So architecture looks like that. Uh, we will go one by one to see how uh, we build it. Um, be aware that this is did not uh, talk about OpenStack, neither about Docker, so don't expect any of that. Um, but um, we use all the, most of them are Python technologies, and we did that project in a few months where it's still not finished, we are still working on it, but most of it we have done it by using one and two, 1.2, 1.3 FTEs, so it's, it's not much, much people, so the, the amount of resources that you require for doing it, although it seems like a huge service, it's not that big. So we have here uh, the VM architecture here. The VM is separated, the VM service is separated from the rest of the stack. Uh, so we start uh, describing the VM architecture. The VM architecture is just a VMware solution. You may, be, uh, may, may know these VMware solutions. It's just a, uh, ESXi servers uh, and you can manage these XCI servers using vSphere control panel and some APIs. And we have external backup server where we do the backups, uh, but it's not replicated. So if something happens, uh, then we uh, rebuild the, the VM and uh, recover the things from the backup server. So the flow is easy. Um, a user enters to the Django web panel, um, uh, authenticates, so we know who he is, and then he asks for a, for a new uh, managed web server. Um, a host name and an IP six and four uh, are allocated to this side. Uh, the VM API creates a new VM. Um, the VM API installs the OS, and when the OS is ready, Ansible is executed, and Ansible is the one that uh, configures the whole machine. So it's, uh, we are using Ansible uh, as a configuration management, and it does everything we need. Uh, for those that doesn't know Ansible, uh, it's just um, a bunch of things together. Uh, they are easy to script, uh, so it's very easy to understand what they are doing. And uh, they separate into folders, which is really good, and you can find the file that you are looking for, and there is separation of things that, uh, in the different files that you can see. So it's pretty good to use. Um, it also has an inventory, so you can define all your servers based on uh, dynamically or static. So you can have a file with all your servers, or you can um, inject the output from uh, another API um, as a list of servers you have, or even the database, etc. So it's pretty nice. Um, it works really well. Um, and it's based on playbooks. Playbooks is just a, a, a bunch of roles um, linked to a bunch of targets. So you have a roles and definition of role uh, is things you want to install in, a, in, in this role, in these machines that have this role, and then you have targets, and then you sell, say, this target, these machines, I want to install uh, this role, for example, a web server. A web server can be a role, and the web server role has a lot of tasks that install Apache, configure Apache, et cetera, et cetera. This is an Ansible playbook. Uh, as I said before, uh, you define the host where you want to install things, and then you define the roles that these machines in, in, in this list uh, will have. Uh, for each role, you have tasks, templates, which are Jinja 2 templates, scripts, handles, and variables. You can have also global variables or variables uh, uh, the entering in, into the script. And this is how a role looks like. It's just a bunch of tasks uh, inside the role. Um, uh, you can see that here we're installing packages. Uh, it's a YAML file. Uh, as you can see, and it's pretty easy to understand what you are doing. Uh, and, uh, so if, if you have a good, uh, 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 you're working with, with more people, it's easy to modify the file, change uh, the configuration, uh, et cetera. You can see here that the templates uh, can be used with variables, or uh, Jinja to templates. Uh, we use variables there, and uh, therefore we use the same templates for, for all the configurations of all machines. 
Uh, you also have handlers, which are basically callbacks. When uh, some uh, function in Ansible is executed, then uh, uh, you have a callback later, and you can, for example, if you have updated the Apache configuration or your Django app, you can restart Apache, and the callback is cool. So uh, this is from the VM part. Uh, we use uh, this uh, VMware infrastructure. We use the APIs. Uh, we launch it. We create the VM. Everything is good after that, uh, after Ansible com configures the machine, and then uh, we can offer the service to the user. So if we start from the top of the stack with the authentication part, we have our own authentication. Um, uh, we use Raven. Raven is our authentication service. So you can see that we have a lot of services interconnected using a lot of APIs. It is based on a web auth API, uh, and we have to build a custom Django web backend. But, uh, this could be substituted by any uh, authentication that you can, you can use. You can use the Django one if you want. You can link with your own uh, enterprise if you want, et cetera, et cetera. So the second layer is authorization. Uh, we have like a kind of an LDAP-ish um, service. Um, it's called Lookup. And then what we have there is just a list of users and a list of groups. Uh, we can see these users if they belong to each, uh, which institutions they belong to, which groups they belong to. So the end user can configure their MWS server uh, based on this list. Uh, they can search for another users, uh, authorize them as administrators, authorize by uh, groups, etc. So it's just a basic list. We use that instead of using the Django uh, 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 groups uh, because it's more uh, useful for us because people is using the university to this LDAP service that we have, so they create the groups there, and they are automatically updated if someone leaves, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so when the user has authorized the user, or the user to, to enter to the machine or use the service, uh, we need to still to install the user into the machine. Um, so we have another service over there called Jacto, which provides more information about users. It's like a, a user identity management. Uh, so we get from Jackdo a unique UID from the user. Uh, we need that uh, because if we install the same user in different machines, uh, we still need to identify the files that belong to him uh, or to her uh, in different machines. So they have the same Unix UID, and we use this Unix UID in all the uh, user installs. The user is installed using Ansible as well. Uh, it's installed in all the VMs where uh, uh, it is uh, authorized. And we have periodic refreshes to refresh uh, the, uh, um, the lookup groups uh, we have authorized. So if the groups change, uh, the people different change. And we allow people to upload their own SSH keys. And the SSH keys is also installed in the user uh, configuration. Uh, so they can enter either using the password, which is checked with this LLAP server, or either the SSH uh, that they have installed in the panel. So once they can access to the Django panel and they have the user installed in the, in the VM, uh, they can already access the, the machine. Everything is configured for them, so they can start using it. Uh, for previously, we had also another communication with the IP register API, which is uh, on the bottom there. Um, and this uh, allows us, this is another external service, so. It, we, as you can see, we have a, the main service, and then we have a lot of other services that we communicate with, uh, which provides the university uh, a registration for CAMACAC domains. Uh, so if you want uh, to register a new CAMACAC uh, domain, for example, importantstudies.camacac, uh, you can launch an API. We launch an API request using the, the same Django panel. Django panel uh, sends the request, and then uh, we get the uh, domain name alias. Uh, for that uh, site. So everything is configured automatically. The user doesn't have to worry about the process, the internal processes. Uh, this API uh, uh, tells us if the user is authorized for, for, for that domain name or if this domain name is already in use, etc. And the same API also provides us from uh, IP addresses. We have to pre allocate some uh, IP addresses uh, together with the host name. So when the user requests a new site, he, ha he can access directly using the domain name without having to wait for a DNS refresh. So what we do is just pre-allocate some addresses uh, 
and then when the user gets their site, they can access really using the host name without waiting for a DNS uh, update. We use two IP addresses. We have one addresses, one, one host uh, name as well, uh, as a host address, um, so the communications um, for the host, and another for the service. So if we, can, if we want to move the service to another machine, we can do it without having to modify uh, the host name or, or the host of the machine. So we can separate what is the service and what is the host, and we, could, we can move the, the service IP. Uh, and you will see this is useful later. Um, additionally, we have SSHSP records um, and DNSSEC. Um, anyone knows what SSHSP record stands for? No one, good. Uh, this is uh, to forget about that. Uh, I'm, I'm sure pre pretty much you all have seen this uh, screen like that. Um, and what it does is you can um, upload an SSHFP record into the DNS um, with your public host key, and then you, uh, and if you have DNSSEC activated, you don't have to check the, f the host ping fingerprint uh, uh, manually because uh, the DNS server does it for you. It, it gives you, and uh, the DNSSEC gives you the fingerprint, and then um, when you connect, you check that this fingerprint is the one that is in the DNS server, which is secure communicating with you, and then you don't have to check manually if the fingerprint or the machine you are connecting is the one that it's claiming to be. So that's pretty useful. Uh, as I said, we have a lot of services in the same architecture. We have uh, an inventory there, uh, which is using another API. It's based on JSON API on pool, consume, so we give to this service called BES uh, the data of all our services so we can use it as an external database as well when we know where all VMs are, uh, we know um, uh, where they are located, the IP address they have, et cetera, et cetera, so it can be used even as an inventory uh, for Ansible or it can be used for, for other purposes. So as you saw, we have a lot of APIs, different ways of accessing APIs, we use SSH APIs, REST or non-REST, HTTPS, using JSON, non-JSON. Um, but we have uh, to deal with a lot of them in an asking way because we don't want uh, a Django, the main thread of Django, be stopped by that. Uh, so what we do is executing as a background processes um, using either cron jobs, which is the easy way if you don't need uh, the uh, API executed after just as after the user has uh, launched the petition, or uh, if you want uh, the execution uh, schedule, um, you can use Celery and Redis, which is what we use. Uh, Celery uh, is pretty good for us because it uh, works pretty well with Django. Um, it's very easy to configure. Uh, you just have to um, add um, uh, on the top of the, in the, in the function. You just have to declare that it's a shared task. Um, you can use different templates like this task with failure. Um, you can define the red tree, the number of red trees. Um, you define the uh, template, so you can define if, if it fails um, to log something or send you an email, et cetera, et cetera. So it's pretty easy to configure, and it works pretty well. Um, and you can also execute cron jobs from the same salary. It's called salary bit, it's a bit different, uh, but it, the jobs are, uh, you just, uh, configured as it was a cron job. So it's, it's pretty useful for us. It works well. Uh, and these architecture, these, these salary, uh, these APIs and these services are supporting all of this, all Ansible driven. So um, the changes are done in, the, in Django. Django stores these changes in the database and then Ansible is executed, takes these changes from the database and then uh, it executes these changes on, on the VMs. So we have this service. We went to the community uh, in the university, we made a workshop, and we said, we have this for you, um, we thought that you would like it, uh, and they said, hmm, we would like it, but what about if the service fails? And then we thought, well, we have a backup, um, you can recover for the backup, uh, it won't take too much, we create the VM, etc." And then they said, hmm, but I need an SLA if you, I want to switch to you, um, but we didn't have an SLA because we had a backup, we have a plan, uh, but we didn't have, to, uh, we didn't thought about what happens if 
300 VMs failed on the same time, which requires a lot of time to recreate and a lot of time to take from backups. So some of the people were saying, hmm, we are thinking to change into MWS3, but only if you provide high availability. So lucky for us, we designed the application so it can cope with different VM arch architectures, which is good because you don't have to worry about the VM architecture that you, the VM the architecture that you are using because you are creating the VM using an API, which may be this one that we are providing, or it could be an Amazon EC2 server. And then we execute everything through Ansible. Ansible only needs an SSH connection, so it's pretty easy. So we just need to replace this component, which is the VM architecture. So we thought, okay, let's update VMware with uh, high availability. And then we saw that we need replicated vSphere, replicated the storage, which we didn't have, and replicated the storage for a lot of servers is very expensive to maintain because you need to do a huge uh, uh, file storage that is shared between all the VMs. Um, so we had a lot of things pending from this architecture, so we thought that's pretty risky for the load time we have. Um, better take another architecture because it's still, uh, it's, it's also expensive to acquire all the, all the hardware and software that we need. Uh, et so we decided, okay, uh, we don't want to maintain a huge um, shared uh, file system. So what we do is replicate each one of the VM's file, sale, file system to another one. So uh, we, use, we thought we can use the VMware, uh, still use the VMware infrastructure. We add a pacemaker crossing, which is basically a cluster uh, that checks that all the VMs are uh, in contact with each other and then can change the service network configuration. This is why it's useful to have a uh, service network configuration to any of these two production VMs. So we have a, replication, a replicated VM. The second one, the second column, is just a, uh, a VM that is waiting uh, in something that something fails to, ch to be changed and I start adding as a, as a, the active uh, VM of the cluster. And then uh, we replicated the storage individually for each one of the VMs using the RBD, which is basically a driver that sends all the writes um, of, a, of a machine into the other VM. So the, the, uh, the storage is replicated to the second one, and the pacemaker takes care that if some of the components fail, the switchover is made automatically, so we don't have to worry about it. But then we thought, Phew, this is maintaining a lot of clusters. We may end up with one cluster for each one of the VMs that we're going to have, because for each one of the VMs we will have to have a piece pacemaker cluster, uh, and this is very expensive to maintain, and it may fail. If we need to execute Ansible, we need to execute Ansible in both sides in the two VMs, so they are synchronized, so that's a lot of work, and it's going to break quite easily. So we thought, okay, let's start from scratch. Uh, we move away from VMware, and we decided to use Xen. Um, uh, Xen um, can be um, configured uh, very similarly as the VMware. Uh, so you can see there are two Xen servers there. Uh, they are also executed pacemaker and chorusing. But the difference is we don't do clustering for each one of the VMs. We do clustering for each one of the Zen servers. The Zen servers have a lot of VMs inside. So if something happens with one of the servers, the whole, cluster, the whole server and all the VMs that are inside one of the Zen servers that you can see on the top, all the Zen VMs that have a Zen server are automatically migrated, live migration, to the second one. Uh, and you don't notice anything. Even the sockets uh, keep o kept, are kept open. Uh, you don't notice that uh, the switchover has happened. Um, with the VMware solutions, you will have to wait until we restart the VM, for example, and that kind of stuff. With Zen, you don't notice anything. Uh, you just don't see that nothing has happened. So, but inside, you have changed your VM from one Zen server to the other, uh, but it's completely transparent to you. So for doing that, it's a bit more complicated because this is the file system that we had to use. Uh, this is a very complex file system where you have all the disk, these disks are uh, tied together in a physical volume, and then you have the left one is the uh, DOM0, which is basically the operating system that is running uh, in the Zen server, and then each one of these are the v, uh, each one of the individual uh, Zen 
uh, host. So you have all the storage replicated to the other Zen server, uh, which provides this live migration. So we had a happy uh, transition. Um, uh, it's working well now. Uh, but the architecture is the same because we designed the architecture so we could um, change the VM uh, provided but just change the API. Uh, the API is a middle API, so uh, yeah, we only had to write an API for the Zen server uh, and then execute everything uh, was exactly the same. So we are happy with that. Seems people may be happy with that as well. Uh, and uh, we changed it from the VMware solution to the Zen solution which is three node clusters. Node clusters are in different locations. We can do live migration so the users don't notice anything. It's still using uh, Ansible. Uh, and we also use Ansible to deploy more clusters. So this is uh, an example of the Zen server clusters. We can deploy uh, many of them. Uh, it is easy to deploy because it's Ansible. So if we want to create more Zen server clusters, it's just as easy as create, well, get the machine, the physical machine, start, start it, and launch Ansible. So it's pretty easy. Uh, let's talk one minute about security. Uh, because we like security, well, we are, I am not an expert in security. Uh, we, we like to enforce security to our users so we don't end up with uh, problems. We um, decided to not use root uh, passwords when we create the Zen uh, host so the people, uh, 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 we don't have to manage pass root passwords, which is uh, difficult to, uh, to secure a lot of root passwords in a database. Uh, we don't want to manage uh, that way, so we use, only use key keys. We connect to the machines using keys, Ansible connect to the machines using keys, etc. cetera. Uh, we have a separation of privilege. For example, we need to pre-generate the host keys of the same host. The host needs to be generated previously because we need to upload the SSH FP records before the, even the machine is created. So we need to have a pool of uh, host keys that we can use in the future and, and we can install in the machines. And we use user service, which provides uh, a useful interface, so users um, can execute commands from root users or other more privileged users uh, um, based on some filtering and some templating. And we also provide a TLS certificate service. Uh, this is one, an, an additional one, uh, because we want to follow one of the uh, a new um, uh, uh, initiatives from the EFFF and the Mozilla and AKMA, which is HTTPS everywhere, or Let's Encrypt. Let's Encrypt is an open source uh, CA, which provides you with a free uh, certificate for your web page. Uh, HTTPS everywhere is EFF, uh, um, in trying to uh, force everyone to uh, have HTTPS web servers. And even the HTTP2 specification doesn't, it, doesn't include the to enforce HTTPS, uh, but a lot of people are saying, well, when we move to HTTP2, everyone is going to be HTTPS. That's not really true, but um, um, because the specification doesn't say it, but all the implementations uh, from uh, Microsoft in Internet Explorer, and Mozilla, and, and Google in Chrome are only uh, implemented HTTP use to HTTP2 if it uses HTTPS. So, um, we like it to test our servers. Um, I encourage you to do the same. Uh, if you enter to the SSL labs, you can get a qualification of how secure is your, ser your web server, uh, which is pretty good um, because it gives you some hints of if you have any open, uh, uh, open back, uh, all the specification, all the version of OpenSSL, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, um, uh, apart from security, uh, changing topics, we use also some metrics and logging systems. So we can have users, we can give users some information about how their hosts work. For example, we use a metric uh, service, which is basically a stats D and collects D uh, um, in each one of the machines installed, also using Ansible. Uh, we have a cluster of uh, message brokers that get this information from all the hosts. And then we have a cluster of carbon graphite, which is stored this, uh, uh, this information uh, gathered from all the machines. So the user can see uh, these graphs in their panel, in the web panel, and, and they can see how the machine is behaving, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we are now trying to implement Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana, which also provides information about 
uh, the hosting, uh, the, the, the web server, and how it behaves, where do you have the, uh, the visits, how it behaves uh, uh, during different periods of time, et cetera. So you can have uh, a lot of uh, logs gathered by Logstash star, uh, st um, stored in, in Elasticsearch and then showed in, in a Kibana. So that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about. I hope uh, you like it. Thank you. Thank you, Abraham. And we have a few minutes for questions. Any questions? Yes. Um, why did you choose Shen instead of KVM, for instance? I mean, <laughs> what made you choose one thing and not the other? Um, this was a long discussion we had with <laughs> between, uh, between the developers, which is basically three. Um, uh, we didn't have any external reason, a, a strong reason to, to choose one or the other. Uh, we saw, uh, doing a little bit of research, that Shen uh, um, worked a little bit better with uh, DFDD, which is one of the main components we wanted to use um, because we wanted to do the replication of the storage um, from one Zen server to the other. Um, so we saw that uh, it was integrated in, inside the same Zen server, um, and we decided to go that way. But we could have chosen uh, KBM. It was in the list of, of products that we had to research and, and decide. Hi, thank you for the talk, it was really fun, but to be honest, I didn't really understand the subtleties in the last architecture because you had several hard drives and that you have several Zen servers that actually overlapped on several drives. So were they virtual servers or? Uh... Yes, so this, um, the whole picture, the, so this is the picture of the um, VM architecture on the top. Uh, this is more the view of uh, the file storage. Uh, you, this is a single machine with a rate of uh, disks and this is a file, a, file, a file storage for a single machine. Um, so you have the physical volume, and then you have the, f the first column is where it used to be DOM, it's called DOM0, which is the uh, operating system that manage all the VMs. Um, when you access to the Zen server, you access to this. Um, uh, it's, it's also a VM, but you access to this, and it has direct access to the, uh, to the hardware instead of the VMs which have access to the hyper hypervisor. Um, and all the other columns, each one of them, are a Zen host, which are one of these uh, VMs, uh, or DOM U, uh, as it, it's called in, in, in Zen. And each one of them has the DRBD device, uh, which is basically uh, a virtual block device, which is replicated from here to another DRBD server. Uh, like, uh, so you have each one of these DR device are inside this list of virtual block devices, and they are uh, replicated through the network in real time when they are written or read, or only written because it's a sync, um, to the secondary uh, Zen, Zen server. So you, it's done automatically through the network uh, when it's executed, but the difference is each one of them has a DR de device. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have maybe one minute if anyone has a really quick question. Oh, okay, please join me in thanking Abraham once again. <laughs>